Good afternoon. Thanks for joining Family Caregiver Alliance for Residential Care Options 101. I'm Calvin Hu, Education Coordinator at FCA and your host. For four decades, FCA has been working across the Bay Area and the nation to improve the well-being of family caregivers. We offer support through consultations, classes, workshops, publications, retreats, research, and advocacy. If you'd like to learn more about us or access our online resource center, FCA Care Journey, please visit caregiver.org. Now for some quick housekeeping during the webinar, uh, your phones or mics are going to be muted, so if you have any questions, you can ask them by using the chat style question box on your screen. We'll answer as many questions as we can at the end of the webinar. If you have to leave a little bit early today, we do archive all our webinars and they can be viewed later on at caregiver.org. Finally, uh, we're going to be asking you to give some feedback after the webinar ends. We use this to help shape future education programs, so I'd like to thank you all in advance for filling those out. So today I'd like to welcome Ariel Green. Uh, Ariel is a, the Caregiver Support Specialist for Sheltering Arms Senior Services, a division of Baker Ripley in Houston, Texas. She received her Master's in Social Work from the University of Texas Arlington. Ariel's passion for working with caregivers and seniors actually began uh, when she was a dementia care specialist at the Fort Worth chapter of the Alzheimer's Association. So now that you know a little bit more about today's presenter, I think I'd like to turn things over to Ariel. Thank you, Calvin. Hello, everybody. I'm so happy to be presenting on this topic today. I know that this is a hot topic for many people, and so we're going to just jump right in. And so we'll be covering residential care options. And so today, um, the, the basic um, goal of today, the learning objectives, um, is simply just to identify um, the reasons why residential care is needed. Um, we're also going to talk a little bit about um, the different types of care and how to evaluate facilities and um, really what that means when you're looking um, for a residential care. We're going to talk about something that I know that's most important to most of you all is how do you pay for care and then we will go into talking about how to cope with the transitions of care because um, a lot of times that is the most difficult thing is to just cope with the decision of transitioning um, a loved one um, into a residential care facility. So next slide. So what is residential care? I often hear that word being thrown around a lot um, in the community. And so residential care simply re um, refers to long-term care that's given to either an adult or a child, um, and they stay in a residential setting rather than in their own home. So rather um, in their own home or their own community, they're in a more residential setting where care or different types of care is um, being provided, and we'll talk a little bit more about what that care looks like in these different types of um, communities. Next slide. So there are many different types of residential care, and these are the most common. So if you look at the, um, the top, the first one is really kind of the basic is independent living, and we'll take a deeper dive um, in the next slide. Um, but the main types of care are independent living, assisted living, nursing home care, and um, memory care. And then you have your con continuing care retirement communities, otherwise known as um, CCRCs. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about those, but that's where you get all of your care kind of wrapped into one. And it's like a tiered system where you, um, you go up as you need more care. Next slide. So the first um, one that we'll talk about is independent living. So independent living is uh, its like a community where individuals live, and I have seniors here, and um, forgive me, I don't know who's on the, the call, but um, I mainly work with, with seniors, but this could be for, for anyone um, that's needing assistance. So independent living is where an individual is able to still live independently in their own um, unit or um, home, rather. And so this is where you have additional, some services are provided, such as meals, activities, and housekeeping. And so 
the people that are living in these types of facilities are mainly able to still maintain their idea, I mean, their ADLs, which is activities of daily living, so bathing and dressing, and they sometimes need assistance with more of those instrumental activities of daily living, and what what they refer to as IADLs, such as meals, housekeeping, and things of that nature. And so they usually still have like a kitchen or a, you know refrigerator. It's kind of similar to more of a college-style housing where you have your activities and you have your meals there, but you're still independent and still maintaining your own um, care needs. Um, But you can also bring in care if you're needed. So it's pretty much the basic level um, of care um, in terms of um, what we'll be talking about today. So still able to live independent, um, and they just have some services being provided. Um, such as the meals and the housekeeping and activities. Next slide. So assisted living is kind of more so a step above. Um, And so these still include the meals and the housing and the transportation and the supportive services. However, they are able to meet the needs of those that are needing assistance with their activities of daily living. So if someone needs assistance with saving or dressing or medication management, they're able to provide um, that assistance to the individual. And so it's a little, it's a step above just managing meals and transportation and housing um, and activities. It's also providing um, personalized supportive uh, health care services. So um, not um, as extensive as a nursing home, and we'll get to that in a minute, but it's just meeting the needs of those activities of daily living. So if they need assistance with medication, if they need assistance with um, bathing or dressing um, and meal preparation, that's mainly being provided in an assisted living type of setting. Most um, or some states or some areas may defi- divide the care up um, by type A and type B. So in the state of Texas, and I think in a couple of other states, um, so type A type of assisted living is for those that in the event of an emergency, they can evacuate on their own. So they're still able um, or still pretty mobile and also cognitively able to recognize an emergency and evacuate in the event of an emergency. In your type, and they also don't require any nighttime um, care. In your type B Um, facilities, those individuals do require nighttime assistance or routine care at night, and they will, in the event of an emergency, need assistance with evacuating. So those are the the key differences with your type A and your type um, B assisted living facilities. And so if you are in an area where they categorize, you just may want to ask, okay, what does this type of care mean in a type of assisted living? What does type A mean? what does type B um, mean? And so um, you always just want to kind of understand the licensing when you're when you're going out and looking at the facilities is what type of care is being provided. And if you're ever unsure, because a lot of times people use words interchangeably, so they may say independent living and they may be referring to assisted living. So you always want to just inquire about, you know, what type of care is being provided and that will also help you in your, your search. So next slide. So then we have our memory care. So if you're caring for someone that has Alzheimer's or some type of dementia, this would um, more than likely be the best care option. So these are um, memory care facilities provide supportive services um, designed for individuals that have Alzheimer's disease or some type of dementia. And usually um, the licensing requirements are sometimes different. So the staffing requirements, the training requirements are different. if you're in a memory care facility. So the ratio may be a little lower or the type of training that the staff may have to have or the type of facility if it has to be, you know, it may have to be secure. Um, And so every state varies in terms of a licensing. So in the state of Texas, in order to be designated an um, Alzheimer's certified facility, um, you have to have a certain level of security and um, the, the facility has to be secure and it also has to have it there's also a different ratio and the training is very different um, so that they're able to provide quality care for those that have Alzheimer's and other related dementias and so this type of care can be provided either in a nursing home or an assisted living facility so in a nursing home this is where you know we'll we'll talk about it later where more care can be provided more specialized 
complex uh, medical needs. And in an assisted living facility, more than likely, um, if there are memory care and they are certified, they're going to be a type two facility because that that individual will need assistance in a you know with nighttime care and um, evacuating in the event of an emergency. And so your memory care is um, for Alzheimer's or related dementias. And just you know when you're out looking for, at the places, just make sure you inquire about um, the type of facility that um, and the type of certification that they have. And next slide. Okay, and so um, the next type of care is um, these are your nursing homes. And so your nursing homes are kind of at the top level. Um, these are going to be the places where um, if that individual has um, complex health care needs, so anything that requires um, a nurse to manage um, or they need um constant care or complex medical services such as if they have they need um, they have diabetes or if they have, have a ventilator or anything that's that's pretty com complex that requires um, a nurse to complete um, the task um, that's going to be your your nursing home so with those types of facilities they have to have a nurse on staff 24 four hours a day, 24-7. Um, and so most of the time with your nursing care, all of the care is being provided, you know, all of the medical services are being provided within that, um, that nursing home. And I'm just going to pause one second because my computer just, you can still see the screen, but I can't see the screen. And so um, next slide, Calvin. So your, the last um, type of care is going to be your continuing care retirement communities, and these are your CCRCs. And so in these type of communities, these are full service. So if you were to require the service of an independent living and then now you require the service, you know, you require assisted living, you would have to, to switch facilities and move. Most places just have one type of care. But in your CCRC communities, these are full-service communities that offer a continuum of care um, across the long-term care needs of an individual. So they usually include your independent living, your assisted living, um, your nursing services, all in a single care setting. So they're separate, but they're all under one roof. And so this usually provides an individual with um, a smoother care transition. Um, and they may be, the, the, the cost of care may, may vary between, you know, state to state and facility to facility. But a lot of these places usually require some type of entry fee um, in order to uh, gain access um, to the care. All righty. And next slide. Okay, so a lot of um, the the main question that come that comes up that I often get is when is it the right time to move my loved one into a nursing home or to an assisted living or to into a residential care a different you know residential care type facility and um, the 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 time and I always tell families that it's a very personal decision and. Um, it's never, you know, what's, when is the right time for one person is, is different for the other. And so it's a very, very personal decision. However, there are some common reasons um, for residential care um, transitions, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. But I always um, tell families that it's different for every person, and obviously there are some common things that um, we'll discuss in a minute that kind of prompt the conversation um, for residential care, and so we're going to go into that um, right now. So next slide. Okay. And Calvin, is it on the the common reasons for residential care? Because I'm not. Mine's is still on the memory care. Sure. Yeah. Reasons. I just want to make sure. 
Mm-hmm. Reasons for Reasons. residential care transition. Okay. Yes. Okay. Well, I have it in front of me, so I, I know that it's there, but my screen is it must it might have um have frozen a little bit. So we'll just we'll just move forward. So some of the common reasons for um residential care transition is simply the big reason is that there's just a need for more skilled care. The person is is needing more um care. Um, the other reason is the health of the caregiver. Um, maybe their health has declined, and a lot of times, and as you, you all listening probably know, is that you're probably providing care for, you know, your loved one um, and, and assisting with all those tasks, such as bathing, dressing, meal preparation, transportation, housekeeping, all of those things. And there are some times where that person or that individual that's providing the care, they're just not able to to do it. You know, they're not able to provide um, that care either because of employment, either because they have to move or because of their health. Um, primarily, they're just not able to maintain that level of care for the individual. And so now they have to bring in, um, you know, another form of support, such as a residential care facility. The other one is if you're caring for somebody with dementia, a lot of times the reason um, for residential care transition is simply because the behaviors or the care is becoming too difficult. That person is now wandering or it's no longer safe for them to be at home or they require um, more hours of care than the caregiver is able to provide. Um, and so that can lead to um, the discussion or prompting one to say, okay, well, maybe it's now time for us to think about a memory care or for us to think about an assisted living. And then the other one is this need for more assistance with your activities of daily living. So, you know, um, Maybe now you 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 were able to you know prepare your own meals, but that's becoming a task for you. Or you were able to you know uh, you had the proper you know the medication management is another piece. Now you need that piece, or you need someone to provide um, assistance with those uh, more complex medical needs. There's a hospitalization that's occurred, and that person can no longer go back home. So um, those are some of the common reasons why. Um, these transitions take place. Um, and with that, it comes a lot of different emotions. And I want to move on to um, the next slide um, because with these transitions, it, it, it really does bring out a lot of emotions and a lot of things that, you know, um, people don't necessarily want to deal with. I work with a lot of families and they often um, say, you know, uh, I promised my mom I would never place her in a nursing home, you know, but now I'm just not able to do it. And they feel a sense of guilt, even though they know that that they're not able to provide the care. And so I want to talk a little bit more about coping with the decision. So um, we can move on to that slide. So the first thing um, with when you're having the conversation about uh, transition, care transition, is that you want to acknowledge your emotions. You know, it's okay to feel sad. It's okay to feel regret. It's okay to not want to necessarily make that decision. But you just want to start there by acknowledging how you feel about the situation because a lot of times that can hinder you from making a move because we're not acknowledging our emotions. And then the key thing that I always encourage families to do is that when you're thinking about these transitions and you're getting stuck, always remember that you are still very much involved in their care and you are still the caregiver. Um, a lot of families, once I tell them that, they're like, you're right, you know, um, and it's kind of freeing to know because they think that, you know, when they transition or they move their loved one to a facility that their job is over and that it's like they're putting them in a, in a place. And I'm saying, no, you know, you still are very involved. If something happens, trust me, they're going to give you a call. Um, and if there needs to be a move, you can always change your mind. It's not a permanent place. Um, you know, it's a, it's a long-term care setting, but if that setting no longer works for you or you're not happy with the care, there are a number of ways to advocate for your loved one. And so a lot of um, caregivers find that a little bit freeing. It's just recognizing that you're still involved. It's just you adding another person to the team to help care for your loved one. And so that comes with, you know, moving on to the third point is explore new ways of looking at the situation. So thinking about how you're still involved and thinking about the opportunities that are going to come along with that transition. 
So maybe now that your mom or your dad or, you know, your sibling, they're in a, a care um, home, they're now getting more care, quality care, and, you know, there may be some additional benefits such as activities. Now they're they're more social. A lot of people that transition, their health ends up improving. So always encourage, I always encourage um caregivers and families to explore new ways of looking at the situation and don't look at it as all bad or all good. You know, it simply is what it is, um, but recognizing that there may be some opportunities for um, positive health change um, in that person and also in the caregiver. It will also free up some time for you to where you're not having to do a lot of those complex health care tasks that you were normally doing, and now you have the opportunity to just kind of visit with your loved one. So thinking about um, a new ways to look at the situation is sometimes sometimes helpful. And then the last thing that, you know, that's really important is to seek out support, whether that's from another family member or for someone that has gone through the same thing that you're going through at the time, um, through a support group or through talking to an individual, or also just getting information about, um, you know, these different types of facilities. Um, and try to get as much information as you can, and there are a lot of supportive resources out there, and we'll talk a little bit about that um, in a second. But it's really important to have that support from the places that you're looking at as well as just within your own normal support team and system. And so next slide. So now you've, you know, now that you've reached the point of, um, you know, wanting to, um, transition, there are a couple of things that you want to consider. So the first thing is that you want to consider the care needs of the individual because that's going to help you pick the right facility. And then the second is the cost, which is going to be important. And then the third is the location and then um, state records. So what is the what, what information can you find out about the facility? Um, and also the staffing needs is an important thing to consider, and activities. What what does that look like um, in the the facility? And so we're going to talk a, a little bit um, about um, a few of these. And so the first one before we switch slides, um, care needs. I always encourage family members to and caregivers to just simply you know make a list of the things that your loved one needs. Because that way you can go into a facility and when you're touring these places, you can tell them their care needs. So you don't want to get in a situation where you're either paying for more care than you than you need or you move into a place where they're not getting the care that they need because it's not the right level. So you want to have a clear understanding. And most of the times we know what they need, but it's just making it plain and writing it down. And so when you're going out and you're looking at online or you're going into the facilities, when you're reading through the, those brochures of the care that's being provided, you can kind of pull out those key words and say, okay, yes, this is what they need, this is what they need, this is what they don't need, because you don't want to pay for something, you know, a service that you, you don't need. And then the other, the other thing is the cost of um, the facility. You want to look at the cost and also look at the, the that person, whoever is the payer of the service, if it's the individual, you want to look at their financial situation and see, you know, are there any issues that are going to come up um, with the cost? Are they, are they not going to have, how long can they sit, stay in this place and be, you know, and financially be able to, to pay for that? And is that going to cause another transition? Um, because if it is, then you may want to kind of think ahead of time and say, well, maybe we go with a place that in the event they cannot afford um, another benefit such as Medicaid or a VA service, which we'll talk about in a minute, will be able to um, pay for that that care. Because a lot of times families will go into a private pay facility, they'll find a private pay facility for their loved one, and then a year that the money is gone. So now they're having to move and transition into another facility well, if you can already look at the expenses and anticipate that's going to happen, then that may influence the place in which they go. Um, and then you have location. And so that is, you know, what are, you know, geographically, you know, you want to pick a place that's close to you if that's important. 
Um, where are the family and friends? Where Where is that person's support system? And so if you know that they're on this part of town or in this part of the 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 country, then maybe that's the place that that best suits their needs. Or from a cost perspective, maybe this location is a little bit more reasonable. And so those are the things um, that you want to look at in the areas of care needs, cost, and um, location. And then um, we'll move on to the next slide, which I have more information on. Um, and this is where they're talking about um, in terms of evaluating the facility state records. So most facilities are licensed or certified by the state in which they're located. So it's always a good, um, in terms of evaluating the facility, is to go and take a look at that information because when you're going out to tour these places, you can take that information. And a lot, it doesn't mean that if they have, you know, a ding on the record that they're automatically bad, but it is a point of conversation that you could have with the facility. Hi, I saw that this was listed on your on the state website. Um, can you tell me a little bit more about this or what steps have you taken to um, to change this? And so these inspection reports are usually available to the public. And so um, I'm, I'm sure every state is different. And um, in the state of Texas, you can go on the Health and Human Service website to view it. Um, but I wanted to give you the resource. I didn't want to just tell you that this is available and then you don't know where to go to get the information. So most um, most or all um, states have an ombudsman program. And so who manages the ombudsman program can vary from state to state. So a good place to find that information and a good starting point, um, I'm pretty sure Family Caregiver um, Alliance has that information as well. Um, but you may contact um, your local aging and disability resource center and you can ask or your local um, area agency on aging and you can ask them um, about the long-term care on ombudsman program in your area and the ombudsman is usually an advocate so if they they go out and they um, advocate for the residents and the families of the facilities that are licensed by the state and so they can tell you where to get those inspection reports. Um, and so they're, they're, it's really good to have, um, like I said, just to kind of be aware of if there are any red flags. Obviously, no facility is going to be perfect, but it is a good starting point. Okay, next slide. Okay, so the next um, thing in, that you may want to evaluate in terms of looking for the right facility is the staff. So you want to know, number one, when you're thinking about the care needs, you want to look at the staffing and ask yourself, you know, what are the staffing requirements of that facility? So that's definitely something that you want to get. So if you're caring for someone that has Alzheimer's or some type of dementia, you want to know what type of training they have, what the ratio is, um, you know, what type of requirements they have of that staff, you know, especially, especially training and, and um, ratio. You want to know that information. So what are the requirements of that facility? How do they hire people? How do they train them? You know, what, how long, you know, have they been there? Um, what is the turnover rate? Um, you know, that's the type of information that you, you want to get. And then the second thing, and I just mentioned that, is what type of training do they receive? And then when you're there, you want to know how do they treat the residents. And this is not something that you, I mean, you can ask them and they'll probably say, oh, we, we treat everybody with respect. This is going to be something that you observe. So you're going to just look to see how they treat the residents. Um, a lot of times if you're going to um, visit, I always say or recommend you want to have a planned visit because you want to be make sure that they're able to see you um, and to meet with you. But if you once you've gone to all of the places and you maybe narrowed it down to a few, I always encourage you to just drop by and you know make it make an unannounced visit because a lot of times you know or sometimes they may they they can anticipate that you're coming so they're going to make sure that everything or they might make sure that everything is running without a hitch. But if you just kind of stop by, they're not anticipating that you're coming so you may get a different picture. Um, you may get the same information and you may see something different. Um, the other thing is just um, if you are if you see a family member or someone there that's visiting their loved one, it's always okay to ask them because they're the ones that are, you know, they may have some more information to provide you or ask them if you can attend um, a resident council meeting. That way you can kind of see what the the needs of 
the the residents are and they are expressing those and families may also be present at those meetings and so sometimes the facilities may allow you to come to those those meetings but if you go at least once or twice um you just want to uh, you know observe the uh the staff and then also just ask them about attending one of their meetings and if you see a family member there you can also ask them um, another thing as a sidebar, if you are connected to any support groups, that's also a great way to get information from a di from other caregivers is because they're going to be honest with you because they don't have a stake in that facility. So they're going to tell you exactly, I mean, my mom was at this place or this place really worked. Um, and so that's another great place to start in terms of getting information on the staffing of that particular um, area. And so next slide. So after you are evaluating, you know, the staff, after you evaluate the staff, you also want to look at the facility from a social perspective um, because obviously care is important, but the activities and, you know, the morale of the um, facility is also very important because that's where your, your loved one is going to be living. And so you want to ask them when you're when you're visiting or when you're on the phone or looking through information is, do they offer regular activities, you know, and what are those activities? Do they have a calendar they, they can show you? And then the other thing is not only do they offer regular activities, are the residents or those that are living there actively engaged in the activities? If everyone, if they have the activities but everyone is in their room, that could mean that they they need more assistance getting there or it could mean that there's not an interest and maybe the activities don't align with what the individuals want. So you want to look at what type of activities they offer, if any, and then you also want to look at are they actively engaged in those activities. And then the other thing is um, you want to ask is do they have a dedicated staff person? If they don't have a dedicated staff person, you know, that, that may mean that it's falling on somebody else and it's, you know, when we can get to it, we'll get to it. But if they do have a dedicated staff person, um, that might be a better situation for your loved one because you have someone that is planning activities. And then the other thing, and I didn't list it here, is that you want to look to see how engaged are they, you know, in the community. So are the activities just open to um, just the residents and their families, or do they bring in volunteers? Do they have any type of you know, intergenerational program where there are, you know, different types of people visiting. Um, do they go out and are they doing, um, do they go out on field trips and go places? So those are the types of things. Um, just because someone is, um, you know, in a care facility, it doesn't mean that they're just written off. So you want to look to see if they're actively engaging um, the residents as well as are they actively engaged in the community because that can help um, your loved one transition and then also feel a little bit more comfortable um, in the facility. And so those are some of the just some basic things in terms of evaluating. Um, just as another you know another tid, tidbit is that I would also recommend um, and we do have some there are some resources out there when you're going to the facilities is it's after after you go to a couple of them they may all start to look alike so I encourage you I'm on the internet and I don't know after the webinar I can see if there's a way that we can get this to you, but there are handouts and things that will allow you to, to make notes as you're going on along so that you can evaluate the facilities because you may not remember um, after a while. So I always encourage families to take really good notes, take pictures. Um, there's so much technology out there to where it makes it a little bit easier for you to evaluate because after you start going to a couple of them, it's like looking for an apartment or a house. They all kind of start to blend blend in. And so having those notes and having those photographs will also help you um, in your evaluation um, process. So kind of building a kind of like a record system of all of the places. And so next slide, please. So moving on from staffing and activities and things to evaluate, the biggest question I get is, how do I pay for this? I, I know that this is the right option for my loved one. I know that they need to be, you know, I need to transition them into a different um, care setting, but I need to understand the different types of payment options. So for today, we're going to take a deep dive, and we could spend like 
you know, easily an hour on each of these. Um, but we're just going to talk a little bit about some of the, the payment options. And so specifically, we're going to talk about Medicaid, private pay, VA benefits, and long-term care insurance. So the first way um, is private pay. Um, and that's the easiest way because you can just go out, you can find your facility, you can, you know, and you cut them a check every month. It's pretty cut and dry. Um, you know, you go wherever you're able, you know, what you're able to afford. Um, and then the second one, we're going to take a deeper dive into VA and Medicaid. Um, but the other way that some people pay for long-term care is through long-term care insurance. And I'm not an insurance uh, guru or anything like that, but this is where you, you would contact like an insurance person and just um, request information about their long-term care insurance policies. And these types of policies traditionally pay for certain types of care. So they may pay for an assisted living, a nursing home, a memory care, or some type of long-term care facility, and each policy is going to be different. I know like years ago they were writing really good policies, um, and I think now they've kind of caught on because a lot of people are needing more long-term care. So I'm not sure, you know, how the policies are right now. But I would encourage you if that's something that you're interested in, if you have a financial planner or an insurance person, that you should reach out to them um, and talk to them about it. Usually this has to be done uh, years before that person is needing care probably to get the best price. Um, so if your loved one doesn't have a long-term care insurance policy, this might not be the best option for them right now um, because chances are the premium cost is going to be, you know, a little bit higher versus if you would have, if they would have got it, gotten it, you know, 10 to 20 years ago. So this is something that you want to ask um, if you are a caregiver um, and you are caring for someone, inquire about it if they have a long-term care insurance policy. And then also look into that policy to see what, what it is that they cover if they do. So um, if we go on to the next slide, um, Medicaid. So for those that do not have, um, they don't have a long-term care insurance policy, they cannot afford uh, private pay, Medicaid, um, there is state and federal coverage that's available to those that meet eligibility requirements. So uh, Medicaid will pay for some long-term care, um, and I also want to just throw out there. So there's Medicare and then there's Medicaid. So Medicare does not pay for long-term care. Um, a lot of people get that confused. So um, I'm speaking strictly about Medicaid. And so this is, um, these are state-ran programs. So if you've seen one state's Medicaid program, you've seen one state's Medicaid program. Each state is different um, and they run their Medicaid differently. So if you do think that your loved one might be eligible for Medicaid, um, I would suggest um, for more information, you want to contact your lo local health and human aid, health and human services agency or office. If you don't know where to go for that information, a, a good place to start is either the Aging and Disability Resource Center. I believe they have one at least in every county, um, or your local area agency on aging. Um, so these are state-ran agencies, but they usually kind of provide similar assistance. So when you contact them, just ask to speak to a benefits counselor. Um, or if you're on the internet, just get, do a quick search of your Health and Human Services Agency, and I can guarantee that that's probably the agency that's running the Medicaid um, program. And so with those types of programs, you do have to meet um, eligibility. So there, there has to be a need for care. That's usually the first thing. And then the second thing is that there has to be um, some type of financial need. So they look at income and they do look at assets. Okay, and next slide, please. And so the other option is um, the VA. So the Veterans Administration, um, they do have benefits that, um, that are, um, allow people to go into long-term care facilities and they will assist financially. Um, there are some programs as well that will provide long-term care. So the VA has nursing homes available, and um, they also have contracts with community nursing homes. Um, so they're able to actually provide the care. Um, and also there are programs that help um, pay for the care. So one of them that provides a pension is called aid and attendance. And so that is used, that can be used to pay, be, to pay for long-term care. 
And that can be either long-term care in a facility or a long-term care in a community or a home setting. And so um, for more information on um, those services, um, you want to go and, and talk with um, either if your loved one is already connected to the VA, you can start with asking to speak with a social worker or speak with the healthcare providers at the VA. Um, if your loved one is not service connected or they don't, um, they don't attend or their medical treatment is not provided by the VA, each um, area or county usually has a local veteran services office. So that's another thing that you may just search um, or, I don't know, I think Family Caregiver Alliance has like an elder uh, care resource locator. You can go on there and get the local resource for your, your community. Or if you just do a, a quick Google search and just say, you know, whatever your county is and type in Veteran Services Office. Um, the VA also has some information on their website as well. Um, but each area is different. So my recommendation would be if they're connected to the hospital, um, and they're getting their medical care there, they just inquire um, um, at their doctor's office or ask to speak to a social worker, or you can contact um, your local veteran services office, and they are there to assist uh, veterans and their dependents with understanding their benefits and accessing um, their, their benefits. And so um, thank you all so much. That's all the information I have, I believe, um, Calvin is going to open it up for um, for questions, and um, we'll just go from there. Perfect. Thanks so much, Ariel. Um, I was doing uh, a lot of nodding during your presentation. Really, really great presentation. Thanks for being with us this afternoon. Especially, it seems that holiday season, a lot of um, adult children may be returning home and realizing that maybe their parents... Um, Things have changed a little bit since they last saw them, maybe about a year ago or maybe um, a previous holiday. So it's, it seems like it's a good time to go over all these, these various options. I just wanted to uh, mention very quickly before we get into the questions, FCA does have a series of tip sheets on residential care options at our website, caregiver.org. If you have any questions about payment um, and you live in the Houston area, of course, please give... Um, Area, uh, uh, Ariel, a call um, uh, at um, uh, otherwise you can give us uh, a quick ring and we'd be happy to answer any uh, questions in terms of maybe finding out what resources you might uh, be able to uh, use for payment. And then finally, in terms of the visits, in terms of visiting a nursing home, CANR, which is California Advocates for Nursing Home Reform, is a really great local nonprofit that uh, works in terms of uh, patient rights, especially with nursing homes. And um, as Ariel mentioned, it's nice to have kind of a little checklist or to keep really good notes when you visit these places so they don't kind of all blur together. And uh, Canner has a, uh, a printable sheet where you can kind of check off the various things, things that she mentioned, you know, how, what kind of, you know, how, how do residents look? Are they, you know, are they interactive? Are they engaged? Um, it's a really great uh, resource. It's, of course, free to download. Anyways, I just wanted to uh, mention those, uh, those two uh, resources very quickly, and I think it's time to get right into questions. Oh, and the, the website for California Advocates for, for Nursing Home Reform is just the initials.org, canner.org. Anyways, uh, first question, which was, I thought, a very great question. We have a listener whose parents, one has dementia and one does not. So what, I know this is really would depend on um, families and situation and there's no kind of ready answer, but what would you recommend for them in that situation where one parent would need some form of care, it seems probably like a memory care situation, but one, one is otherwise uh, fully independent? Yeah, we do. We get that a lot. Um, and so in that case, I would also encourage, depending on the needs of the person that has dementia and what level where they are, if they're just needing an assisted living facility, um, they just need assistance with, um, you know, maybe some bathing, dressing, um, not a lot of complex medical needs, um, just kind of managing their day-to-day -day care, so their activities of daily living, um, 
to the bathing, dressing, grooming, that kind of thing, and there is still an individual or family member that's present, they may be okay in either an independent living or an assisted living. So with your independent living facilities, you can that they have activities, they also have caregivers there. So if you need to add on a personal care assistant or somebody to come in to provide um, that assistant, assistance, you can get that in an independent living. And the meals are usually still provided. So the caregiver, the one that doesn't have um, Alzheimer's disease, can still partake in activities. And then their, the spouse can also still get their care needs addressed. They also, you could consider an assisted living facility, um, and a lot of times they have um, rates for two people. So that may be an option. It really just depends on what their care needs are. So if they just need assistance with activities of daily living, then they may consider an assisted living or independent living. Or if they have the resources, they may also consider um, a CCRC facility where um, one spouse can be in maybe the lower level of care and then the other one can be um, in the care that suits them. So those are some different options depending on what the financial situation is. However, they may be okay in an assisted living facility um, and that spouse can just have a space um, if they're comfortable and that's something that they would be interested in. Perfect. Thanks so much. Yeah, we I, certainly it's, it's a tricky situation because they would want to want to stay together, but the figuring out, yeah, what, what kind of uh, level of, of services they need would, would differ between, between the two. Um, let's see, I have actually a Texas-specific question that I'm happy to ask you. Um, in terms of the Medicaid benefits in Texas, uh, in general, what are the income and asset limits? So I'm not at my desk right now, but... Um Usually, if it's an individual, it's, I believe, no more than, I want to say, at least $2,300. And then they can't have, that's income, and then they can have assets, I believe, over, I want to say about $3,000. And I, and I may be off a couple of it, uh, but it's not a lot of money. Um, and if they're over the, the income amount... There are, Texas has a couple of, you know, Medicaid planning tools that they, they allow you to do. It's called um, the Miller's Trust or the QIT, Qualified Income Trust, which allows you to set up a trust to filter the money to, so through. So say you're over by, let's say, $500 or even $2, you can, um, you the money goes into a trust and it has to be spent out, I believe, every month. Um, and then part of the monies go, the first, Part of it goes to the facility, and then once the facility has been paid, then Medicaid is able to pick up the rest. So there are a couple of things that you can do if you're over the income guidelines, um, but generally, I think it's about two thousand, um, about two thousand dollars income, and then assets. I think it's about either three thousand um, dollars, and then also it differs for a couple. But that's the basis for an individual. But um, if you if you're in Texas and and um, you just shoot me an email, I'll be at my desk um, like in, after the the webinar is over, and I can give you the exact um, number. Perfect. Thanks so much. Ariel's been a, a good sport in terms of working with the kind of confines of trying to talk to a national audience, and that every state is 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 uh, has kind of different you know different um, guidelines and things. So we appreciate uh, her 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 um, being such a good sport about that. Um, I've got another question about Yelp, actually. This is a, um, um, a listener who's wondering um, what you thought in terms of the reliability or maybe the honesty of some of these uh, Yelp reviews in terms of trying to, I guess, get just a initial idea about some of these CCRCs or independent living facilities or, or other um, um, residential care options. Yeah. Reviews are always kind of tricky with anything because usually you're going, I mean, most reviews, if you're, and I, and I know for me personally, if I have a really good experience with something, I'm, sometimes I don't always write a review. But if I have like an unpleasant experience with something, I'm probably going to be more inclined. I want to let people know. So that's something to consider when looking at reviews. You're going to get, you know, you might get an extreme, like somebody that's really, really, you know, happy or you know, really, really upset, I would just say look for the consistency um, and kind of look, if you see a review and, and, you know, you have, you know, different types of mixed um, 
comments, that's probably going to be a little bit more reliable versus if you see, you know, all negative comments and then all positive comments, because I would question something like that, like who's going in and writing the reviews. I think Yelp kind of protects because you have to have an account with them before you can write reviews, but that's also something to consider. If you see these two different types of extremes, um, that can kind of raise a red flag, and that would raise a red flag for me if I see but if I see a mixture of reviews and they actually seem, you know, honest, so some, you know, are positive things that they're talking about and then some are things that they don't they don't necessarily like about the facility, um, I would more so go with those. I wouldn't write them off. I would still read them. Um, and that's also something, a point you can bring up with the facility as you're going out and doing the tours. But another thing that I would encourage is reach out to your, you know, the community network, so through the support groups and things like that if you can. Um, and try to get some direct feedback um, from from individuals. But with the reviews, if I saw something that was all positive and then I saw the same amount of negative reviews, I would question, you know, who's going in and writing those those reviews, you know, to kind of offset the 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 negative ones. So. Perfect. Thanks. Yeah, I I think I do the same thing. Whereas if I have a bad experience, I'll, I'll immediately write write a review, but I don't necessarily think to do it if I have a good experience. Um, I, I've got uh, I've gotten a number of questions about Canner, so I'll just mention the website again. They're very good people. Uh, the initials are Canner, so it's C like Charlie, A like Alpha, N is in November, H is in Hotel, and R as in Romeo. California Advocates for Nursing Home Reform, and again they have that little um, uh, check sheet for for um, visiting a nursing home uh, for free. Of course, uh, it's it's a nice resource to have. Now, um, I had a, a question, I guess, for you in terms of um, something you mentioned in terms of um, advocating, I guess, uh, for, for care. Is, uh, what's the usual process if, say, someone uh, goes to or, or has their um, loved one placed and they find that maybe the care is not up to what their expectation is or maybe they're having um, issues uh, with staff or, or, or they don't think that they're, the person who's in whatever facility is, is receiving the care they need if it's if they're providing a certain amount of care. What's, um, is there kind of a general process for advocating or, or kind of um, uh, bringing these uh, attention to the, uh, the staff or to the facility? Yes. So there, each, each um, I think through the, uh, I can't, the policy just like escaped my brain, but each state should have an ombudsman program, each, each area. So, um, I know in Texas we have an ombudsman program, and I believe um, the older adults, I mean, the older American, um, the older adult American, that the act, that policy, and I can't even think of the exact naming of the policy, but I think it requires that each state has um, some type of ombudsman program, and so an ombudsman is pretty much a resident advocate. So they go out and they assist families um, with. Um, addressing issues that they have. Certainly, you can always go directly to the facility, but sometimes family members are really concerned about doing that because they feel like there's going to be some type of retaliation or maybe their loved one is going to be discharged from the facility, so they don't want to, you know, that will disrupt the the care of that individual, so they don't want to, you know, um, inquire about or address any issues. So the ombudsman is like the middle person. They don't work for the nursing home. They they really advocate for the residents. So each area has one. So if you're in the state of Texas, um, each county, there's a different person that may manage the program. So like here, um, or in Dallas, when I lived in Dallas, it was the Area Agency on Aging. They managed the ombudsman program. Um, and so each area, there may be a different manager, but they all have the same standards. And so that would be my starting point. And even when you go into the facilities, if your loved one is in a facility, you can always ask the the facility. And usually they have a board. Um, I used to be a volunteer ombudsman. And usually they have a board that has to have all of that information there. So wherever that board is, you can probably um, – that bulletin board is, you can more than likely find that information, or you can ask the facility, or you can contact your local area agency on aging, or your local aging and disability resource center, and I can guarantee that they probably know who that um, managing ombudsman is for your area. So that would be my starting point. Perfect. Thanks. Yeah, that's that. Yeah, that's definitely. Um, yeah, I'm sure a lot of that that makes a lot of sense. Where 
a lot of um, family or caregivers would be worried yeah, about uh, retaliation or maybe yeah, getting discharged or so that that's a that's a great uh, great suggestion. Um, I have a question about um, I guess um, activity activities of daily living or it might be instrumental activities of daily living. We have a, a listener who um, who's um, person they're providing care for needs a little help um, in terms of. Uh, toileting needs in terms of mobility, so I think they maybe they might need some help, you know, um, sitting sitting down on, onto a toilet, or maybe need help getting up from the toilet. Um, would this uh, would an assisting living facility be able to provide uh, that kind of care in terms of help with mobility, in terms of using the bathroom, or is that really more of a, a nursing home kind of um, level of care? An assisted living, um, definitely like a type two assisted living facility probably would be the best one. Um, and so that should be something that they can do. Um, obviously, um, I guess each area kind of probably varies in how they may use the term. But if they don't require any complex, like if it's just the activities of daily living, then I would say, yes, the assisted living would be able to assist. If they have any additional um, type of complex um, medical needs, um, that requires the assistance of a nurse, then I would say a nursing home. But if it's just the mobility um, and they just need some assistance with, you know, getting in and out of the, the bathroom, then I would say an assisted living facility, if, especially if the person can still kind of bear their own weight um, and, and provide assistance and they only require probably like one person to assist them in, in the, the bath area then that definitely should be an assisted living that could fall under assisted living if they don't have any complex medical needs that require assistance of a nurse. Okay, perfect. Yeah, thank you. Um, we have another question, let's see, related to, I guess, uh, again, uh, I guess, um, cap capabilities of, of someone who might be uh, might uh, enter into a, a residential care facility. Uh, and the lister wanted to know if, um, you know, I guess trying to be proactive, how you might maybe even anticipate uh, the changes in a person's need for help uh, or whether they might even have dementia when they don't have it currently. I, th I think the, the question is they're trying to think, you know, what it, I think they're trying to um, be able to try and anticipate what, what, the, what levels of care might be needed. Is there anything... Um, really you would recommend for that or is it just something that you kind of um, um, deal with it as, as it presents itself? Yeah, I think it's kind of hard to anticipate um, unless you kind of see some signs of, of dementia or if you know that depending on what their health, their current chronic diseases are. So if they have an issue that you know, you know, say they have you know, MS or something like that, an already an existing condition, and you have information about what that condition is and what that looks like. So with dementia, you know that as a disease or Alzheimer's, you know that as the disease progresses, you can expect these kind of changes. But if you if they don't have any type of, any of those healthcare issues, um, like an actual diagnosis of something, it is kind of hard. But if they already have an, an illness, you can kind of look at the the trajectory of that illness and that can kind of guide you as to this type of place may be better. But if they don't, it is a little, it, it is a little harder to kind of anticipate. And so maybe in that case, if they're able to go into a CCRC and they're in an independent living facility, you seek out facilities that you know that they have multiple levels of care. So maybe they have a nursing home and an assisted living. A lot of places have, have those, or maybe you look at a complete CCRC where they have everything. Um, if you don't have an idea of what type of ill, if they don't have an existing illness like dementia or something that you know there's information on about the, the prognosis of that or the trajectory of that disease. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, I think we have time for two more quick questions. I know we've already, uh, we're just at one hour. Um, but I wanted to ask a, a question actually just, uh, it's kind of in the back of my mind. We've had a lot of wildfires or we still have wildfires. Uh, in California right now, I know there's um, there's been flooding in Texas and, and all sorts of, you know, storms and, and kind of natural disasters. And we see these pictures of um, seniors, you know, waist deep in water. In terms of uh, like a nursing home um, um, 
I guess maybe in any of these um, continuing care facilities, are they mandated to have some form of uh, evacuation plan where um, there's a plan where the staff knows what to do and then, you know, if a disaster strikes, you know, where the residents are going, um, where they're going to be meeting, how they're going to be contacting family, things, things of that nature? Yes. So I can, I can speak for in Texas. Yes, they should have a plan. Um, I would imagine that most states have you know, the licensing. So that would definitely be a, that's a good question to ask when you're out visiting the facilities. I know in Texas, um, they do have to have some type of emergency plan. We have an adult day center here and we don't have anybody that lives here, but we have a plan. Um, and they have, you know, documents in place in the event of an emergency. They do regular fire drills. They do things like that. So in, in the state of Texas, yes. And I will lean and say that in most states, um, especially if they're licensed and they receive any type of funding from the state or if they're li- a licensed facility, then they should have some type of emergency um, management plan or system in place in the event of a natural disaster or, you know, you know, a disgruntled family member or something like that. Because even with natural mm-hmm. disasters, we have, you know, other crimes and things like that that are happening. So um, they should have some type of plan. That would definitely be a question that I would certainly ask the facilities um, is what does that plan look like and do you have a plan? Perfect. Thank you. And uh, for our final question, um, I thought there's actually going to be more uh, questions about this, but we have a listener who wanted to know, um, I guess, again, recommendations. Uh, what What you might recommend if someone doesn't want to leave their home, but really they're not able to safely live at home and the um, family or friends are just not able to provide the care in terms of the capability or just don't have, um, you know, don't have the, are working and they just don't have the time to be able to, uh, to be there to make sure um, everything is, everything is safe. If the person um, doesn't, that's a really good question. If the person has capacity then it's ultimately their decision. Uh, it's a little bit harder to remove them. So if the person has dementia which or Alzheimer's disease, which it doesn't automatically mean that they don't have capacity, um, but if you think that they're not able to make their own decisions for themselves and that they lack capacity and they are refusing, then I would contact, and this is, I mean, Adult Protective Services, a lot of people are like, no, we don't want to get them involved, but sometimes they're able to go out and do an assessment to determine whether or not that person has that capacity and they can get other professionals involved, especially if they're very resistant. If they're not as resistant and you can have a conversation with them, I would try to have a conversation with them and get the buy-in from them. But if they have an illness or they have some type of cognitive impairment, and they're not making the best decisions and it's no longer safe for them to live in the home, then you're going to have to contact Adult Protective Services and you may have to file for some type of guardianship, you know, to be able to make that decision for them on where they they live. Um, But if they're not agreeable and that is the whole issue is, is the, is a capacity thing. We deal with a lot of people that have dementia and live alone and we provide assistance to them, but at some point it's no longer safe for them, but then they don't want to move um, into a nursing home or into some type of facility. And so we have to usually rely on adult protective services to come in and do their assessment. And then we also have to file for some type of guardianship so that that individual can be moved out of that, that living situation safely, even when it's not something that they would like to do. So, um, yeah, it's a very tough situation, but I would try to get the buy-in from them if you can, but if you can't, then you do usually have to seek some type of legal um, action or take some type of legal action. Sure. Thank you. Yeah, definitely. It seems like it's always the, always the kind of the the moral dilemma between independence and, and safety. And we want to provide them the most, independence and freedom and kind of, you know, management of their own life as possible, but also trying to to make sure there's not, not undue risk in terms of them injuring themselves or, or maybe, you know, having other uh, accidents when um, when there's no one around. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, I think that's all the time we have uh, for questions today. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone for participating in today's webinar presented by Ariel Green. Uh, the FCA webinars are free and continuing series, so if you'd like to learn more about the next one, you can visit our website, caregiver.org. 
I'd like to thank um, Ariel again. Thanks, Ariel, for joining us this afternoon. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Hope it's been helpful to you all. I think I think it's been um, a really a really fantastic webinar. Um, we also want to uh, want to wish you and, and all the listeners a happy holidays, happy safe holidays, uh, and we will see you all in 2018 for our next webinar. All righty, thank you so much.